In this video, we're going to be discussing substance abuse. Specifically, we're going to be discussing stimulant abuse. Now, in our previous four or five videos, we've been discussing uh, uh, CNS depressants like alcohol. We talked about barbiturates and benzodiazepines. We also talked about opioids. So I highly recommend you guys go check those videos out. You can find them on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash madmedicine. There is a psych playlist that you guys can watch, and uh, you can find all our psych USMLA Step 1 videos there. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel while you guys are there. And with that being said, let's start talking about stimulants. So stimulants are neurologic agents that temporarily increase our alertness and energy. And hence, on the street, they're often called uppers, right? So you may hear that on TV shows, someone saying, hey, I want an upper, I want a downer. Downer are seen as depressants. Uppers are stimulants. And then talk intoxicating uh, effects of these stimulants are very non-specific. You're not going to be able to figure out if someone has, uh, if someone's been taking a stimulant or a downer simply based off of their effect. You need to have some uh, surrounding information, some physical findings as well. So these uh, symptoms are going to be mood elevation, psychomotor agitation, insomnia. You could also have cardiac arrhythmias like tachycardia uh, or just other arrhythmias in general. You can also get anxiety because it is a stimulant. So there's four stimulants you need to know for step one, and we're going to talk about them all in this lecture. We're going to be discussing amphetamines, cocaine, caffeine, and nicotine. So with that being said, let's just dive deep into it and let's talk about amphetamines because that's very, very high yield. Amphetamines are substances that contain phenylethylamines. Phenylethylamines are the main active ingredient. Okay, so let's just write that down. Active ingredient in uh, amphetamines. And the main drugs that are classified as amphetamines are benzedrine, Adderall, methylphenidate, and methamphetamine. Adderall and methylphenidate, I'm sure you guys remember from our ADHD videos, they're often used for ADHD. And uh, these all are CNS stimulants and they have indirect sympathomimetic function. Now what they do directly is that they increase synaptic dopamine and norepinephrine levels. Dopamine and norepinephrine. That's very, very important. So we're going to write that next to amphetamines. Amphetamines increase dopamine, all right, dopamine, and they increase norepinephrine. All right, that's the main two things they have, the main effects they have. Now, they have multiple uses for ADHD and anesthesia, but uh, when it comes to intoxication, the main, uh, the main symptoms you will see of patients who have amphetamine intoxication is going to be that they're going to present with grandiosity and euphoria. They're going to feel great, amazing. They're going to be in a hyper alert state and they're going to have a decreased need for sleep because this is a stimulant. And as, as such, they don't need to sleep with the stimulant. They're also going to have sympathetic stimulation like tachycardia, hypertension, and mydriasis. Mydriasis is pupillary dilation. So if you guys remember back in our previous video, we talked about opioids. In opioids, when they're intoxicated with opioids, people are going to have pupillary constriction. Right? And when they go through opioid withdrawal or they're coming off of the opioids, then they're going to have mydriasis. Uh, in, the, in the case for amphetamines, if someone is intoxicated with amphetamines, during the intoxication, they're going to have pupillary dilation, a.k.a. mydriasis. So it's completely opposite of uh, opioids. That's the way I like to think about it. So I'm going to put this one over uh, similar to sign with opioids. There you go. Whatever. You get the point. Anyways, and then the rare symptom that can occur with uh, amphetamines are going to be chest pain, cardiac arrest, and seizures, pretty much because of the fact that you have sympathetic stimulation occurring. Now, when you want to treat amphetamine intoxication, you're going to use a very classic CNS downer called benzodiazepine. Benzodiazepines are used because uh, they're used to treat the seizures that could be associated with amphetamines. And just a fun fact, so you guys remember, benzodiazepines also have a decreased risk of respiratory depression. If you use barbiturates, uh, depression, if you use barbiturates, you're going to have an increased rest, so you want to make sure you use benzos to decrease uh, their, their seizure uh, occurrence. So that is amphetamines. That's all you need to know for step one. Uh, mainly covers everything. The next topic we're going to talk about is going to be cocaine. Cocaine is one hell of a drug, guys. One hell of a drug. And uh, it is a CNS stimulant, okay, like we've talked about. And it has two main mechanisms of action that you should be aware of. First of all, 
The very first mechanism of action for cocaine is that it acts as a local anesthetic, and it does that by blotting, blocking the sodium uh, channels that are on our nerves. So what ends up happening is that cocaine functions very similar to lidocaine, right? Lidocaine, uh, obviously you can tell that they're similar because they have the suffix cane in them. So they're both going to block the sodium channels in our nerves, allowing uh, nerve firing to become delayed and slower. The second mechanism of action for cocaine is going to be inhibiting monoamine reuptake. So what are monoamines? Well, we've already discussed two of them, and this is monoamines are the class of neurotransmitters that are often associated with a uh, euphoria, and the, like their name says, they have one amine group in them. These are uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, and in the in the case for cocaine. Cocaine is going to inhibit all of these, right? It's going to lead to an increase in dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine uh, um, uh, availability in the synapses because it's blocking the reuptake of monoamines. So cocaine, unlike amphetamines, is going to actually lead to an increase in dopamine, okay? And uh, so does amphetamines. It's also going to lead to an increase in norepinephrine, so we're going to write that down to epinephrine, and it leads to an increase in 5-HT, also known as serotonin. That is the key distinguishing factor with cocaine uh, and uh, um, amphetamines because amphetamine will not lead to an increase in serotonin. So what happens in cocaine intoxication? Well, cocaine intoxication is going to present very similar to amphetamine intoxication with grandiosity and euphoria. You're going to have a hyper alert or stimulated state, and uh, you're also going to see sympathetic stimulation like fever, tachycardia, hypertension, mydriasis, or pupillary dilation, as you can see here, very similar to a CNS stimulant. You, you are also going to have hallucinations, tactile hallucinations. And this is very important because this differentiates uh, cocaine from amphetamine. You're going to have tactile hallucinations, which may present with anxiety, paranoia, and they might mimic psychosis. Okay, You're also going to have something called a perforated nasal septum. So what is the nasal septum? Uh, the nasal septum is what differ, uh, what splits our nose into the left and right nostril. So that's what's the nasal septum. Now, why does the nasal septum become perforated? Well, because when you uh, snort cocaine, and most people snort cocaine, that's how it's taken, guys, just so you know, this is a line of cocaine that gets snorted through their, your nose. Uh, when you snort cocaine, Cocaine has a local anesthetic effect like we talked about, right? But another thing it does, especially in the nose, is that it locally causes vasoconstriction. And the vasoconstriction of the local blood vessels leads to decreased blood being delivered to the tissue in the nose. And over time, it's going to lead to necrosis because of the lack of blood flowing there. And, and that necrosis is going to become a perforation in the nasal septum. So a, cl a clear way to distinguish a chronic cocaine user is to ask them to close one of their nostrils shut with their, no with their finger and then take a deep breath in through their nose. And when they take a deep breath in, you're going to hear kind of a whistling sound. And that tells you that the, the nasal septum is perforated. That happens with cocaine simply because of the physical uh, use of cocaine. And then finally, the last thing you need to know about cocaine is cocaine chest pain. Uh, this is also something that can lead to sudden cardiac death. So let's talk a little bit more about that. By the way, these four or these three intoxicating uh, side effects is what differentiates cocaine from amphetamine use. So let's talk about cocaine chest pain. Now, the cocaine chest pain is very common among cocaine users. What ends up happening is that your body has an increased oxygen demand due to the sympathetic stimulation, right? That is uh, the tachycardia and the hypertension that's happening. Unfortunately, unfortunately, your body gives a, a very limited amount of oxygen supply because you have coronary vasoconstriction happening. And that leads to O2 mismatch. And the classic presentation for O2 mismatch in the chest is going to be angina. Anginal pain is what happens when uh, uh, patients who are taking cocaine uh, feel chest pain, right? Now, this can lead to formation of a thrombus that leads to MI and sudden cardiac death. This is the same mechanism of action for the, uh, the perforated nasal septum like we talked about uh, due to ischemic necrosis in the previous slide. 
So that is what happens in cocaine chest pain, right? You have an increased oxygen demand due to the tachycardia, but you have decreased oxygen supply because the coronary arteries are vasoconstrictive. Oh, sorry, the coronary arteries are just vasoconstrictive. There you go. And uh, that leads to angina. Now, the treatment for this is going to be benzodiazepines. You can also give aspirin and uh, alpha blockers. Now, you want to avoid beta blockers. Very important. You want to avoid beta blockers because they can worsen the hypertension, right, and the chest pain because of increased and unopposed alpha effects. That's the main reason why. So you want to give alpha blockers, no beta blockers. So we're going to write that down. So beta blockers and with the beta blockers we're going to draw a circle and cross them out so you're not going to give beta blockers for cocaine chest pain so that is pretty much everything you need to know about cocaine we're going to move on to my favorite drug something i use all the time and man this is an amazing drug i'm sure some of you guys are hooked on it it's caffeine Caffeine is found in coffee. It's also found in certain other aspects of uh, our day-to-day -day life, like black tea. Black tea has a higher amount of caffeine. I think green tea also has some amount of caffeine, but I don't know much about teas. I know about coffee. Anyways, you can also find this in workout supplements like pre-workout, hydroxycut, and like I said, I'm currently addicted, and uh, I'm in the pre-contemplation stage. Pre-pre-contemplation, because uh, I don't even know I have an addiction, apparently. <laughs> I guess I wrote that when I was making this, this side deck. Anyways, caffeine functions as a CNS stimulant. We already know this. And uh, it is an antagonist of the adenosine receptors, right? This was something interesting when I was studying for step one. I didn't realize that caffeine antagonizes adenosine receptors. And this leads to release of dopamine and norepinephrine in the synaptic class. So caffeine functions very, very similar to uh, uh, amphetamines. You're still gonna, gonna have increased dopamine, and we're gonna write that down. So you're gonna have increased dopamine, and you're gonna have increased norepinephrine as well. Very similar to amphetamines. All right. So think of caffeine and amphetamines as a very similar class. Now, uh, what ends up happening is that because you're antagonizing the adenosine receptors in your body, the renal adenosine uh, blockade leads to mild diuresis, and that's why you have to use the bathroom uh, when you drink coffee and you have to pee like your body weight when you drink a lot of coffee. Now you wanna watch out for caffeine when chemical stress testing is done for stable angina because IV adenosine is usually given to induce the coronary steel when you're looking for stable angina. And caffeine is gonna block these effects. So when you are, uh, if you get asked about a patient who is having stable angina, goes in for chemical stress testing, but it comes back negative, there's nothing really happening, it could be because they have been taking caffeine. All right, so that's all you need to know about caffeine, mainly all you need to know uh, for this slide deck. The next topic is going to be nicotine. Nicotine is found in tobacco, and it is a CNS stimulant, but the way it works is kind of different than the rest of uh, the stimulants we've been discussing. Nicotine acts on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, these are found between the pre- and post-ganglionic neurons in the sympathetic nervous system and in the adrenal medulla. So, by the way, guys, everything I'm writing in red is very important for this slide. Now, when it comes to nicotine, because it's uh, uh, activating the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, it's also going to activate the sympathetic nervous system, which is going to lead to fever, tachycardia, hypertension, and mydriasis, right? Pupil uh, dilation, very similar to all the rest of the stimulants that we have been discussing. And uh, uh, nicotine also causes restlessness. So if you guys haven't smoked, uh, it's good for you, first of all. Second of all, if you guys have smoked, you may know that uh, when you smoke, it leads you to be a little restless and you have to do some stuff. Anyways, nicotine withdrawal, on the other hand, leads to an increased appetite and weight gain. Uh, patients might suffer from depression, insomnia, irritability, difficulty concentrating, and uh, the symptoms are the worst during the first three days after cessation. I really didn't know that. After the first three days, the symptoms end up subsiding within four weeks. This was just a fun fact that I thought you guys might want to know. Make sure you guys understand the mechanism of action because this is very high yield, okay? 
So we're going to write that down. This is high yield as fuck. Now, when it comes to treatment, when it comes to treating nicotine addiction and nicotine abuse, you have a few options. The first option for treatment is going to be nicotine replacement therapy. And people often use patches, they use gum in order to supplement that nicotine and uh, uh, make sure that they don't smoke. Because the main hazard from smoking is not just the addiction of nicotine, it's the fact that you're smoking in carcinogens. So for those people who want to quit smoking, we use solely take them off of uh, the addicting part which is nicotine addiction by giving them nicotine replacement and that nicotine replacement usually uh, goes down in dosage as they progress through uh, the the program right that's what ends up happening now another drug that you can use or an, a drug you can use for treating nicotine is going to be bupropion Bupropion is an antidepressant that blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. That's very important. It's also used for ADHD uh, and for depression in general. Uh, the one thing you just want to watch out for bupropion is for patients with low weight. Uh, it can lead to seizures because bupropion increases the seizure threshold uh, in patients who are anorexic. So that's definitely something you want to watch out for. And then finally, uh, the last drug you can use is called uh, varenicline. Varenicline is a partial nicotinic receptor antagonist. And what it does is it blocks nicotine's effect on the brain and it limits the withdrawal symptoms that someone might be having when it comes to withdrawing from nicotine. So with that being said, that's all we need to know about our uh, CNS stimulants. Thank you so much for listening to this, uh, this content. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you guys don't know, you can find our lectures on your favorite podcast service for free. Just search Mad Medicine, and you'll find us on every uh, podcast service that you use. Thank you, and continue on to the next topic.